Hello, my name is Dr. Minde and I'm going to continue with the lecture series on the anterior wall. So in the previous lecture, we were discussing the rectus abdominis muscle. So that's where we will start from. And remember, we said it has two heads uh, of origin. So the lateral head is from the pubic crest and the medial head is from the pubic symphysis. And then we said that it inserts onto the zygoid process and also inserts onto the costal cartilages of the fifth to seventh ribs. What is the action of rectus abdominis muscle? It causes flexion of the trunk. Rectus abdominis muscle is covered by rectus sheath. What is rectus sheath? It is a strong, incomplete, fibrous compartment containing rectus abdominis muscle. It's a strong, incomplete, fibrous compartment for the rectus abdominis muscle. What forms rectus sheath? The rectus sheath is formed by the fusion and separation of the aponeurosis of the three flat abdominal muscles, the internal oblique, external oblique, and transverse abdominis. So the fusion and separation of the aponeurosis of these three muscles form the rectus sheath. At its lateral margin, remember you have three um, muscles. The most superficial is external oblique followed by internal oblique, the transverse abdominis muscle. So you have to put that in mind. So on the lateral margin of the rectus sheath, yeah, remember rectus sheath is what covers the rectus abdominis muscle and you have two rectus abdominis muscle, one on the right and the, another one on the left and they both run parallel to the midline. So on the lateral margin of the uh, um, rectus sheath, internal oblique aponeurosis usually splits into two layers. Internal oblique, each of the three muscles have an aponeurosis. Internal oblique has an aponeurosis, internal oblique has one, transverse abdominis has another one. So at the lateral margin of the rectus, at the lateral margin, uh, the internal oblique aponeurosis splits into two layers. One layer will pass anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle, and the other layer will pass posterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. So you have two layers of the internal oblique aponeurosis. It splits into one layer that passes anterior and another one that passes posterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. So this is what we are discussing. You have external oblique muscle, internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscle. So each of them, they have an flattened end, which is called the aponeurosis. So these are the flattened portions of these muscles towards the midline. This is your midline where you have your linear alba. So this is external oblique aponeurosis, internal oblique and transverse oblique aponeurosis. So towards the lateral margin of rectus abdominis muscle, what has happened to the internal oblique aponeurosis? It splits into two where one layer passes anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle and another layer passes posterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. So the anterior layer joins aponeurosis of external oblique to form anterior wall of rectus sheath. So what forms the rectus sheath? Anteriorly, the anterior wall is formed by anterior layer of internal oblique aponeurosis as well as the aponeurosis of external oblique. Posteriorly, the rectus sheath is formed by the posterior layer of um, posterior layer of internal oblique aponeurosis as well as the aponeurosis of the transverse abdominis muscle. So posterior layer is formed by the joining of aponeurosis of transverse of, uh, abdominis muscle and the posterior layer of uh, the internal oblique aponeurosis. So the two of them will form posterior wall of the rectus sheath while anterior wall of the rectus sheath will be formed by anterior layer of aponeurosis of internal oblique fusing with the aponeurosis of external oblique. So that's what this slide says. The, remember we said the internal oblique aponeurosis splits into two, an anterior layer and a posterior layer. The anterior layer joins the aponeurosis of external oblique to form the anterior wall of rectus sheath, while the posterior layer joins the aponeurosis of transverse abdominis muscle to form the posterior wall of the rectus sheath. So, these walls of the rectus sheath, anterior and posterior walls, yeah, these fibrous uh, walls, they interlace at the middle to form a midline tendinous raphe, which is the linear alba. So you can see anterior and posterior wall, they interpose at the midline to form what you call the linear alba. So they are going to, um, mix the aponeurotic uh, 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 fibers of the oblique muscles in the transverse abdominis muscle 
they interlace at the midline to form a tendinous raphe, which is called the linear alba. So it is narrow, inferior to the umbilicus. Remember, the rectus sheath is narrow, inferior to the umbilicus, but above the umbilicus, the rectus sheath is wide. So towards the inferior part of the umbilicus, the rectus sheath is narrow, and above it, it's wide. So linear alba lies between two parts of the rectus abdominis muscle. So you have right rectus abdominis, left rectus abdominis, covered by rectus sheath. Rectus sheath are the aponeurosis of the three muscles. This aponeurosis interlaces at the center to form linear alba, and linear alba is at the center between right and left rectus abdominis. And remember, the umbilicus is located inferior to the midpoint of linear alba. Umbilicus is inferior to the midpoint of linear alba. So this rectus sheath, superior to the costal margin, what happens? Yeah, we've explained how the rectus sheath, most of the rectus sheath form. But you have um, specific areas where the formation of this sheath is different. Remember we said you have the three muscles. So the aponeurosis of internal oblique separates into anterior that joins external aponeurosis and posterior that joins the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. And these two will now form the anterior and posterior walls of the rectus sheath. However, superior to the costal margin, what happens? That posterior wall of the rectus sheath that we say is formed by internal oblique and transverse abdominis. When you get superior to the costal margin, this posterior wall is not there, it's not present, it's deficient. Therefore, the transverse abdominis muscle passes internal to costal cartilages and internal oblique muscle is attached to the costal margin. So the transverse abdominis pass internal to costal cartilage while internal oblique is attached to costal margin. So the rectus muscle actually lies directly on the thoracic wall superior to the costal margin because these muscles insert onto the costal margin. So the posterior wall of rectus sheath is deficient. Remember, posterior wall is supposed to be formed by aponeurosis of transverse abdominis and internal oblique. But they didn't form an aponeurosis superior to costal margin. They directly inserted onto the costal margins. Therefore, the rectus sheath is deficient posteriorly at the area above the costal margin. So the rectus muscle lies directly on the thoracic wall. It's not covered by um, rectus sheath posteriorly at this area superior to the costal margin. Then the inferior quarter of the rectus sheath, what happens? When you get inferior part of the rectus sheath, it's also deficient because the internal oblique aponeurosis does not split to enclose the rectus muscle. Remember, the internal oblique was splitting into anterior and posterior, then they go around the rectus muscle. But on the inferior quarter of the rectus sheath, the internal oblique aponeurosis does not split to enclose the rectus muscle. So the posterior wall of the rectus sheath is also deficient on this inferior quarter of the rectus sheath. So you have what you call acute line. Acute line is a crescenteric border that marks the inferior limit of the posterior wall. Okay? So, we said that internal oblique muscle has an aponeurosis that splits into anterior layer that passes anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle together with external oblique abdominis and a posterior layer together with transverse abdominis aponeurosis from posterior wall of rectus sheath. This only happens this posterior wall only exists up to the acute line. So below the acute line, the rectus sheath is deficient. Below the acute line, the rectus sheath is deficient because internal oblique does not split to enclose rectus muscle. So the whole internal oblique aponeurosis now passes anterior to the rectus muscle. So the acute line marks the inferior limit of the posterior wall. Below acute line, there is no posterior wall of rectus sheath because aponeurosis of internal oblique did not split to enclose rectus abdominis muscle. It passed anterior to it. So this acute line, where is it located? Between, it's midway between the umbilicus and the pubic crest. The acute line is midway between the umbilicus and pubic crest. Therefore, inferior to the acute line, what happens? The aponeurosis of all the three flat muscles, they pass anterior to rectus muscle to form the anterior wall. So there is no splitting of aponeurosis of internal oblique abdominis. All the three muscles, the aponeurosis will now pass anterior to rectus abdominis muscle to form the anterior layer. Therefore, inferior to the acute line, posterior wall of rectus sheath is deficient. 
So this is what we are explaining. Normally, um, there you have external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis muscle. They have the aponeurosis. The aponeurosis of internal oblique splits into anterior and posterior. Anterior layer joins with aponeurosis of external oblique to form anterior wall of uh, the rectus sheath, while posterior layer joins with transverse abdominis to form posterior wall of rectus sheath. At the midline, both sides, the walls of the right and left rectus sheath interlace to form linear alba. So this occurs up to the arcuate line. What happens below the arcuate line? Remember, arcuate line is midway between umbilicus and, um, um, and the pubic crest, between umbilicus and pubic crest. So what happens below arcuate line? All the aponeurosis of the three muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis, abdominis all the aponeurosis pass anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle. So the posterior wall of the rectus sheath is deficient below the arcuate line because the aponeurosis of internal oblique does not split. So we lack posterior wall of rectus sheath below the arcuate line and it also lacks above the costal cartilages because these muscles do not form aponeurosis, they directly insert onto the costal cartilages. So it's deficient above the costal margins and deficient below the arcuate line. What are the contents of the rectus sheath? The rectus sheath contains superior and inferior epigastric vessels. It contains the lower five intercostal and subcostal vessels and nerves. Then we have two muscles, the rectus abdominis muscle and the pyramidalis muscle. So those are the contents of the rectus sheath. Superior and inferior epigastric vessels, lower five intercostal and subcostal vessels and nerves, rectus abdominis muscle and pyramidalis muscle. So what is the function of anterior abdominal wall muscles? So we have said that the oblique muscles, they laterally uh, flex and rotate the, tr the trunk. So rectus abdominis will flex the trunk. The oblique muscles will laterally flex and rotate the trunk. The muscles of the anterior abdominal wall also help the diaphragm during inspiration. They help the diaphragm during inspiration. Remember we say during inspiration they will relax, okay, to allow the diaphragm uh, descend and during expiration they will contract to allow the diaphragm to ascend. Then the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall protect the viscera, they help to maintain posture and by contracting simultaneously with the diaphragm when the glottis is closed they help to in, uh, invalsava maneuver. So when you close the glottis and these anterior abdominal wall muscles contract together with the diaphragm they will give you valsava maneuver that will help with the pushing during maturation, defecation, vomiting, and parturition. So valsava maneuver is achieved through the contraction of anterior abdominal wall muscles with the diaphragm and the glottis closed to allow defecation, vomiting, parturition, and maturation. What's the nerve supply of the anterior abdominal wall? We have the ventral rami of inferior six thoracic nerves. So that's T7 to T11, as well as the subcostal nerve, which is T12. The inferior part of the abdominal wall is innervated by two branches of the ventral rami of L1 nerve, and those are the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal. So you get T7 to T11, ventral rami, and subcostal nerve, which is T12, and the inferior part of the abdominal wall gets branches from L1 nerve, the ventral rami of L1, so you have two nerves, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. So these are the nerves and, and the vessels of the anterior abdominal wall. So what are the arteries of the anterior abdominal wall? You have superficial epigastric artery, superficial iliac circumflex, and the veins, you have the thoracoepigastric vein and the superficial epigastric vein. Then you have the lower six thoracic nerves, as well as iliohypogastric nerve, which is from L1 nerve. So superficial epigastric veins, superficial iliac circumflex, thoracoepigastric vein, superficial epigastric vein, the lower six thoracic nerve and L1 nerve, which is the iliohypogastric. Then the deep nerves of the abdomen, you have the lower five intercostal nerves, subcostal nerve, which run between the uh, internal oblique muscle and transverse abdominis muscle. So in the next um, slide, we'll discuss the blood supply of the anterior abdominal wall.